And today I want to look at Genesis 2, 1 through 3. However, I'll read verse 31 of chapter 1. That's the last verse of chapter 1. And then look at the first three verses of chapter 2 of Genesis. So Genesis 1, 31, the Word of God says this, And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God finished His work that He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work that He had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all His work that He had done in creation. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank You for Your Word, and we thank You, O Lord, that uh, You have, uh, in Your wisdom, uh, condescended to speak to us and to instruct us. And may we hear Your Word, and may that Word penetrate us and, and have an effect upon us, an effect of, of growth and sanctification and bearing fruit. So by your Spirit, O Lord, may we hear rightly. May the Word be preached faithfully. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're continuing our series uh, through the book of Genesis. Uh, we're early on in this series, just now uh, looking at these first verses of chapter 2 and uh, the seventh day uh, of the creation week. What is the purpose of creation? Why did God create this universe? And one of the things I've said uh, earlier is that God is making a fit habitation for mankind, and indeed that is the case. But the question is, why? Why is God doing that? And we've made the point that God is a covenantal God, and He has a, a special relationship with His people. And He says, I will be your God, and you will be my people. But why? I want to dig down. Why? Why has God done this? Why has God created us, created this world, uh, come into a relationship with us? Why? And the answer we could use one word, worship. Worship. Moses uh, said to Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 7, when the children of Israel were still in captivity in Egypt, he said, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may worship me in the wilderness. Worship. In Revelation, chapter 4, verse 11, there's the, 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 the uh, angels in heaven saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And so God, as Creator, is worthy of worship and of glory and of praise. Jesus, when He was at the well with the Samaritan woman, said this, the Father is seeking worshipers to worship Him in spirit and in truth. In congregation, I've said this before in other contexts, that my desire for you is that the church of Jesus Christ and we can, you know, that broadly, but then more, more uh, specifically, that our church, our congregation, Coram Deo, but even brought, bringing that even more specific, and particularly the worship that in which we are engaged needs to be brought out of the margin of your life and put into the center. That ultimately is why you exist. To worship God. 
That's got to be the center. And if you are in Christ at one point, you won't be living in the house that you're living in. You won't be working in the job that you're working in. You won't be the father or mother uh, to the children that you are now raising or, or counseling or helping or whatever it is involved. That, that will be done. And we will be with the Lord in glory for all eternity. And there will be worship. There will be praising Him. The reason that we pray for missionaries and church planters, the reason that we do evangelism is because worship isn't happening. And we want to bring in worshipers. And so I'm coming back to this point that God created all of what He made, everything, so that he would be worshipped. And this is why we have the seventh day. It's a very significant day. I'm just going to focus on the significance of the day and then its implications for us. That's really what I want to do this morning. The significance of the seventh day it says God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. So this is the first place in the Bible that that word holy is found. And it's attributed to a day. It means, as I'm sure you know, to be set apart, to be separate, you can kind of say to, to elevate a bit above the others, to elevate above the rest, above the normal. God clearly is distinguishing the seventh day from the other six. He did not hallow the other six days. He did not make them holy. And on those other days, He did not rest. And so at the the fountainhead of creation, before the fall, before sin entered into the world, God established a day that was to be different. I think Adam was aware of that. And we as we get into the implications of this, we'll be called upon to agree with God that a day should be set apart. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. And He rested on this day. That is why it is called the Sabbath day. Shabbat is the Hebrew word for rest. Sabbath. God rested from all of his creative work of the other six days. This does not mean that God was, is just sort of passively lounging <laughs> in his lazy boy chair up in heaven. That's not at all what this means. In fact, in John chapter 5, uh, Jesus is confronted by the Pharisees, or by the Jews, because he healed a lame man on the Sabbath. And they were livid. They were upset. He broke the rules by doing work on the Sabbath. And you know what Jesus said? He said, my father is working until now, and I am working. The Sabbath sets apart the seventh day from the first six, marks God ceasing from His creative work of those first six days, and 
uh, it does not mean that God does not continue to work. He is upholding all of creation on the seventh day. He is governing. He is keeping. He's providing. He has completed his, uh, this is, John Calvin says this, he has completed his creative work, uh, but he continues his providential work. And that is most certainly true. That is most certainly the case. So on the seventh day, God is still busy, if we want to say that. He's still engaged and doing work, as Jesus himself said. But what is interesting is in Exodus chapter 31, verse 17, it says that God rested. When, when, uh, when it speaks about the seventh day, God rested and was refreshed. Now, that word refreshed in the Hebrew is a word that it is used for somebody who's just run a race and has completed the race. <sighs> they're sort of, oh, a refreshment. Almost like they were tired and now they're getting refreshed. That's used for God in that passage. And the reason I bring that out is because I believe that a lot of this, that again, trying to understand what's happening here, it's accommodation language. It's accommodating to us. God doesn't need rest. God is almighty. God is inexhaustible. But we need rest. And so God is setting a pattern for us. God doesn't need to be refreshed. But He is setting a pattern for us who we do need to be refreshed. How many of you have worked more than six days and, and kept working? It's not long where you're like, man, I need, I need a break. <laughs> I, need, I need to be refreshed. I, I need something. I need to step away from all of this. And see, God is giving us this pattern then of six days of labor and one day of rest and refreshment. And so, <clears throat> the Sabbath is for the benefit of mankind, isn't it? You know, the fourth commandment, of course, when that was given in, uh, on Sinai in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, has a particular uh, application to God's covenant people. Certainly that is the case. And it begins with the words, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But the people of Israel at Sinai already knew that the Sabbath was a holy day. They were already aware of that. And so the remember, of course, is God just saying, don't forget it. You know, remember it. Don't forget it. When uh, in the earlier chapters of Genesis, Exodus 16 specifically, when God sent them manna in the wilderness, on the sixth day, God instructed them to gather twice as much manna. And why? So that they would not be gathering it on the seventh day. And then God told them, because the seventh day is a day of rest, a holy Sabbath. This is before Sinai. They were very well aware. The Sabbath then is not a redemptive ordinance. It is a creation ordinance. God established the Sabbath day before the fall. It is not a redemptive ordinance. And it's not a mosaic ordinance. It's a creation ordinance for all mankind, for the good of all of His image bearers, that all people need rest and refreshment from their work, from their labors. It is a good pattern to follow. You know, it's interesting, God set the, 
the, the, the sun and the moon, the, the, the sun to rule by day, the moon to rule by night, right? But also for, uh, for days and seasons. And you think about it, the sun and, its, and your rotation around it, we recognize a day, one time around. And then we recognize months by the moons waxing and waning, and we recognize years by how the, 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 the whole uh, uh, way that the sun and the earth is moving. We're able to figure that out, but not weeks. We don't come to weeks by way of looking at the sun or the moon or the skies. We learn weeks by what God teaches us. And we know that the, and, and, and I think this is significant, this is God's pattern for us. That in seven days we have six in which we labor and work, and the seventh is a day of rest. Is God has set a pattern of work and of rest for mankind. And then let me just say this before going into the implications of this, that the creation Sabbath, this seventh day that God uh, made and recognized is a foretaste of the eternal Sabbath. Um, in other words, this day points heavenward <laughs> or gloryward. Uh, it's pointing forward to something. Hebrews chapter 4 is an important passage, and I'll refer to it again a little bit later in the message, but it speaks on this matter of our eternal rest. And in Matthew chapter 11, what did Jesus say? Come unto me, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. And so we who are in Christ, we who have come to Jesus, we who are in Christ enter into that rest. But we have yet to fully enter it. And we recognize that in many ways, don't we? We, we still struggle with the fall and the curse of the fall, and there's frustrations in our work and in our labors. Every one of us understands that. We all know that. There are frustrations in our work, in our labors, in our everyday life. We still have that. We still battle against temptation and sin. And it's a battle. And we, we long for that battle to be done. We long for to be rest at rest. That's yet to come. And as I said earlier in Genesis, these early chapters of Genesis, eschatology is built in to these. It's it's even though this is the very beginning of creation, there's something happening. There's something greater. Eschatology is built in. God memorializes this day, one day a week, as a pattern and also as a foretaste of our eternal rest. So let's look at then some implications of that. Um, the one is, I've already brought it out, but our life in this world ought to be patterned after God's pattern. To take a day each week, a day of rest each week, is not simply obeying God, you know, obeying His, the fourth commandment. It is copying God. It, it is conforming uh, to God's pattern is what it is. The day was set long before God gave the fourth commandment. And in this sense, we should all be Sabbatarians. Not as the Jews defined it, following all of these rules and you can't do, you know, more steps than whatever, and you can't do this, or that, and all of these rules that uh, uh, were increasing in Judaism and by the Pharisees. Not that, not that way, but as Jesus defines it. 
Adam needed a day, needed time, needed a, 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 a specific time to worship the Lord. And in this way in particular, Adam was a son of his father in heaven. He would, I should say, I keep the day because my father kept the day. I'm a son of my father. And when Jesus in John chapter 5, which I referred to just a moment ago, said that the father is always working and so is the son, he also says this, Truly I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. What's, what's he saying there? Here is the second Adam. Here is one in the image of God like none other. And he says, whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. He shows that he and all people are to base their lives on this pattern which God has set. What the Father does, the Son does. And the sons and daughters do. So the first implication is simply God did this. He worked six days and rested the seventh as a pattern for us to work six days and to rest one day. And this was designed so that we may worship. It is a holy day set apart. Even Adam, before the fall, needed a focused time in which to worship. And so do we. And I know that we could say all of life is worship, and in a certain sense that is true. But there, we all recognize there's a uniqueness to what is happening right now. When God's people gather together, we're singing together, we're praying together, we're hearing the Word together, we're growing together, and we are communally praising God and worshiping Him. That is a unique worship. Even though we can say all of life is worship, we are, you know, uh, uh, living sacrifices, and all of that is absolutely true. But what is happening here is a unique gathering of worship that is right and biblical. And we all need a focused time in which to worship. And now, I don't intend to really delve into all the reasons, but we know that uh, the apostles then, uh, and through the apostles, we recognize instead of the seventh day, we recognize the first day of the week because of Christ's resurrection on that day. And in Him, we are a new creation. Just let that start thinking, let that start simmering. In Christ, there's a new creation. And in the new creation, that day changes from the sixth, from the seventh to the first. And so where before you labored the first six days and then you rested, now we come into the presence of God on the first day. We, we rest and then we are able to go then on the next days to labor in His name. <coughs> first day of the week because of Christ's resurrection and in him we have a new we are a new creation Jesus said man was not made for the sabbath but the sabbath was made for man for our good for a blessing and to be a focused time of worship why did god create so that he would be worshiped
in saying that, the Sabbath was designed to give us rest. To give us rest. God's pattern is a rhythm of work and of rest. And in his great wisdom, he gave us that pattern. He gave us that rhythm to regulate our lives. And that's good. It, it's a prevention from workaholism. <laughs> it's like, well, we need to just step back, step back a moment. And because work can become an idol for us. Making money can become an idol for us. And uh, we could have that tendency, couldn't we, to just work, 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 become workaholics, make more money, do this, work, work, work. God says, no. Six days you shall labor. The seventh day is a day of rest. Step back from that work. Worship me. Rest. <clears throat> Ignoring this, we suffer. Our families suffer. Suffer. Our society suffers. It's a prevention of stress and anxiety. There is a refreshment to the day for us to be refreshed. It's also, I think, a prevention of laziness. Six days you shall labor. <laughs> That's important. We are called upon to labor. We look at the seventh command, uh, the fourth commandment, thinking it only refers to the seventh day, but actually it refers to the whole week, doesn't it? In six days you shall labor. But the seventh, you rest and worship. God's pattern is a rhythm of work and rest that is good for us. Parents, be, in a, be a good example in this to your children. Call the Sabbath a delight that we find in Isaiah. Call the Sabbath a delight. Sadly, for many, we tell our ch children to believe in God, but we live as though it really doesn't matter. And I think on this day, we can specify and say, that's one day where that's obvious. Not just believe in God, believe God. Not just believe in God. We say that we believe God, but then we don't really listen to Him. We don't, we don't hear Him. We don't really believe. Watch out, parents. Don't let your children see that in you. Another thing, the Sabbath is not a day of inactivity. Um, some, have, some have concluded that that's what it means. That we just, you know, maybe we worship, but then we go home and, and really just don't do anything else. We just sit, maybe read a little bit, but that's about it. It's, uh, you know, and it's got to be reading good Christian books. Um, and I don't, I don't mean to disparage that at all, actually. But all I want to say here is the Sabbath is not a day of inactivity. Again, Jesus said, my father is always at work. Always at work. There, there's no ceasing of God's governing all of creation. Jesus there isn't obliterating the rest on the Sabbath. But he was vindicating the work that he had been doing, which was in harmony with the Father's purpose. He was doing good. He was healing. He was comforting. And the Father, what the Father does is always, he's always doing what is good. And so the, the Sabbath is not a day of inactivity. We should come gather to worship. We should gather to worship. We shouldn't just lay in bed and say, oh, it's a day of rest. I'm just going to lay here and rest. No, we should come to worship, gather with God's people, give Him the glory and the praise that is due Him. 
We also do works of necessity. We recognize that. There are things that, uh, you know, uh, Scott and Darcy are in the medical field and, uh, you know, injuries and diseases and sickness. They don't take a Sabbath. <laughs> they continue. And uh, they need caregivers. And uh, that's, a, that's a necessity. Uh, if you live in an agrarian uh, community where there's dairy farms, the dairy farmers, they have to be engaged at particular times on the Lord's Day milking their cows. Their cows have to be milked. They can't not do it. <laughs> it's a work of necessity. And we've always recognized those kind of things, that there are these works of necessity uh, that is appropriate. It's right. And, and caring for one another, uh, visiting one another. Uh, hospitality, inviting people over. These, these are good things. These are activities that are right, appropriate on the Lord's day. So the Sabbath is not a day of inactivity, but it is a day set apart. The Sabbath is also a sign to us that we are a pilgrim congregation. And Hebrews 4 really brings this out. There's still a Sabbath rest yet to come. And we are on our way. We're, a, we're pilgrims. We're, we're headed toward that. Jesus indeed gives us rest now, but there yet remains a Sabbath rest for us. We're not yet home, but by God's grace, we're on the way. We're not yet home, but by God's grace, we're on the way. We taste that rest. We have that rest, but not in its fullness. Again, it's the already and the not yet. We long for its fullness. And do you know what that means? Those who long to be with the Lord in glory, those who long to have and enjoy that eternal rest, that fulfillment of rest, they love the Lord's day as a foretaste of it. As a foretaste of it. And if not... I think there's probably a spiritual problem and a misunderstanding of the Lord's day. One final thing. Sabbath includes the idea of trust. Sabbath includes the idea of trust. Again, in Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about the many in Israel who were in the wilderness who did not enter into God's rest because it says the message that they heard did not benefit them because they, that message was not united by faith. And so because of that, they did not enter into God's rest. But then it says, but we who have believed enter that rest. So there's something about the rest, Sabbath, that includes trust, includes faith, includes belief. Apart from the faith, trust, belief, there's no rest. We can, we can observe the day and sort of obey the fourth commandment. But if you're just going through the motions... and not resting in Jesus Christ, trusting in Him. It is not truly rest. It is not truly keeping the Sabbath day holy. To truly be at rest is to believe in Jesus Christ to believe what we heard and saw in the baptism, that we're born in sin. And God cannot allow anything sinful in His presence. And so, how, how's that going to be solved? That's, the, that's a huge issue. How's that going to be solved? If God 
cannot have anything unclean, anything that defiles, anything sinful in His presence, how can we be in His presence? Because I'm a sinner. That's, that's the question of questions. And God answered that. God provided for that. He gave His Son, Jesus Christ, to come into this world and to give Himself as a sacrifice for us. He took our place. We are, because of our sins, we deserve punishment. Jesus took that punishment on Himself. And God says, kiss the Son. Believe in Him. Trust in Him. And your sins are forgiven. It is well with your soul. You can look forward to eternity in heaven, in the new heavens and the new earth. And then and only then will we enter into that eternal rest. It is by faith in Jesus Christ. And apart from that, there is no rest. Apart from that, there is no rest. And so keeping the Sabbath is an act of confession. In one sense, it's saying, God is Lord, and He's Lord over my time. And so I'm going to pattern my time under His Lordship. So the Sabbath is a great day. It's engraved by God in both creation, but also in redemption. To be set apart for us to focus on Him and to trust in His salvation in Jesus Christ. Only then can we enter into that rest.